Thanks, Alan and Mark, for having me. Um, I have my disclosures, and I will disclose that I'm a pretty liberal diverter, so. Um, so why do we divert? Um, generally, it's to protect a low pelvic anastomosis, um, but then we also have to consider the patient, um, including immunocompromised patients, which we uh, do a lot of, um, and then some of those abdominal catastrophes, too. Um, so, of course, diversion isn't without consequence. It subjects patients to additional operations. Um, they can get small bowel obstructions, um, acute kidney injury from uh, high stoma outputs, um, and then, of course, the hernia risk, um, and other complications that can arise at the time of surgery during the reversal of the stoma are also um, considerable. So when do we divert? So generally, again, this is going to happen when, when we're operating low in the pelvis. Um, and then uh, pouches are another uh, reason to divert. Um, and again, our immunosuppression and spillage. So just starting with these low colorectal anastomoses, um, this was a nice study, randomized controlled trial, um, done with over 200 patients. Um, and again, I want you to look at the fact that it, we talk over and over again about symptomatic leakage. Um, so the symptomatic leak rate was around 20%, um, which was greatly reduced when the patients were diverted. Um, and also their need for urgent reoperation was much lower when they had a protecting stoma. Um, now they continued to look at those patients long term, um, and the risk of having a permanent stoma for those those patients um, were much, much higher in the group that weren't diverted at the time of their original operation and had symptomatic leak. Um, so this is kind of echoed in some meta-analysis looking at over 8,000 patients, um, just showing that the absence of the stoma was associated with much more symptomatic and asthmatic leak and reoperation. Um, so this is very similar in our coloanal anastomoses, too. You can do these in multiple different ways, hand-sewn, stapled, straight, J-pouch configuration. Um, and one thing to consider with these patients is that their risk of anastomotic stricture um, is much higher. And this may be contributed to um, by the neoadjuvant radiation. Um, and probably about a quarter of these patients will actually end up with the stricture. Um, and a lot of times, these are too low to redo the anastomosis. Um, but luckily, the, they're diverted. So you know, the best treatment for them is just to continue dilating them. You will eventually get them to a point where they can be functional and then reverse their ileostomy. So the iliorectal anastomosis is actually one that has a super high leak rate. Um, and the large majority of those actually come from the patients um, that are operated on for slow transit constipation, believe it or not, um, which may be kind of indicative that there's some other underlying process going on with those patients. Um, luckily, the FAP group has the lowest rate of leaks. Um, and you know we still use this a lot for our Crohn's patients that may have some rectal sparing. Um, and diverting them will actually bring their leak rate down to about 2 to 7%, which is really good. Um, we also have to think that those patients that may end up with a permanent stoma, it's usually because of reactivation of their disease process and not necessarily because of an anastomotic complication. So then we come to our immunosuppressed patients. Um, these can come in a wide variety of forms. Um, the one thing to remember here is that these patients are way less likely to tolerate a leak. Um, they're either immunosuppressed because of medications um, or because of their immune status, um, and they just don't have the medical reserve generally um, to tolerate that sepsis. So steroids is a really big one. We know that it inhibits the inflammatory response, um, and that may lead to decreased wound healing. Um, the large majority of our transplant patients are on uh, steroids, and then about 20 to 30 percent of our IBD patients are still reliant on steroids when they come in at the time of surgery. Um, so for every paper that says that there's no associated leak, there's another one that says that there is an associated leak. Um, so there's much controversy um, kind of arising from this. Um, and most of the authors would say that even though um, there is no uh, associated increased risk, that they would still use caution in patients that are on steroids. So then we come to our wonderful, lovely friends, the biologics. Um, and again, you know, for everyone uh, that says there's no increased risk, um, there's others that say there are. The large majority of the data comes from Remicade. Um, and even initially, that you know, it found increased risk of opportunistic infections and sepsis in those patients. And so we were all worried about, OK, what about when they get to the point of surgery? Um, and even large meta-analyses still um, kind of go back and forth with this. Um, but we definitely know that we need to use caution in these patients.
Um, so then that brings us to our pouches, which is usually um, the patients that we're operating on. So for anyone who decides to do their pouches without diversion, I have the number for the Gamblers Anonymous hotline, um, because I think that that's actually a pretty bad thing. Um, so one thing to consider is that these patients um, that end up with this symptomatic and asthmatic leak um, actually have a, a really decreased um, measure in their quality of life overall and their pouch function long term. Um, so given that these patients are usually on this you know, cocktail of um, usually biologics, maybe some steroids, um, I much prefer to do a three-stage procedure so that I can get them off of those medications and back to a normal healthy immune system before they get their pouch. Now the disadvantage of this, of course, course, is that they undergo more surgery, um, and that can come with additional complications, um, but they are definitely kind of better off in the long run um, because of that uh, decreased pelvic sepsis risk and the long-term um, functionality of their pouch. Um, so then the abdominal catastrophes come up. Um, and I think we have common um, ties with the trauma literature here um, because, you know, they looked at um, gunshot wounds and uh, other forms of trauma where they would go ahead and do a primary anastomosis and then divert proximally and that the patients actually do pretty well. Um, and I think as colorectal surgeons, we all hate Hartman's procedures, mainly because of the Hartman's reversal. Um, and we do know that those patients undergo a lot more um, morbidity and mortality um, and may end up with a long-term stoma if we do a Hartman's procedure, as opposed to doing that primary anastomosis and then just having to reverse an ileostomy later. So then we get to how do we divert? Um, so one of the things um, that we find very important in our practice, we actually have three stoma nurses amongst the clinic and inpatient staff that do a lot of counseling with our patients. So this is um, you know, quite emotionally traumatic to the patients. Um, they worry about things like intimacy and will anybody know, am I gonna smell? Um, you know, all of these thoughts are reeling through their heads and I think it really helps for them to sit down um, with a trained stoma nurse prior to um, you know, getting a stoma. So any of our patients that were even considering this as a possibility, we have them meet with our stoma nurses. It also helps to have them marked beforehand um, so that you can get a good spot. Um, and that should be on either side of the midline, um, usually a little bit inferior to the umbilicus um, and over the abdominus muscles so that you have some support for the stoma. Um, now, one thing to consider is that the patient needs to be able to see the stoma um, and access it without difficulty. So this is really tough in some patients that are super obese um, because if you put their stoma low um, amongst the panis, you're actually going through a lot of the subcute tissue, which can pull on the, the bowel as it's heading out to the skin. Um, and the patients will have trouble seeing um, where the stoma is and, and changing it. Another thing to consider is like folds, prior incisions, where their belt line hits. Um, and so if you're in like an emergent situation and you haven't had the chance to do a pre-op marking, um, you can go about a third of the way from the umbilicus to the ASIS, um, but also kind of uh, look at the lay of the land and what their abdomen looks like as well. Um, so this is just showing uh, kind of where you would generally want to put the stoma. Um, again, probably a little higher in your obese patients. Um, and in an emergent setting, you look at that line between the umbilicus and the ASIS, and you'll probably go somewhere about a third of the way away. Um, so then looking at the difference between the ileostomies and colostomies, you can see that the colostomies are a little bit more bulky. Um, they're definitely a little bit harder to pouch because they um, are much bigger on the skin. Um, and so a lot of times the loop ileostomy is a little bit easier to take care of. Um, but you can configure the colostomies in a little bit of a different way. Um, you can do a, a distal mucous fistula that can be kind of small, a little bit lower profile, um, or also this in-loop colostomy where you just dunk the distal end um, just underneath um, the fascia. So just looking at the differences here, of course, you have higher stoma output with the ileostomy, which can lead to AKI and readmission for a lot of those patients, and higher risk of small bowel obstruction. But about everything else is um, better um, outcomes with an ileostomy. Um, and with the colostomy, you're talking about higher hernia rates, stoma prolapse, much more difficult to create and to reverse, um, lots of difficulties pouching, um, but they may have a few um, uh, 
things better than the ileostomy. So just in conclusion, um, the most important goal here whenever you're considering diversion is to protect your anastomosis. So especially in the pelvis, especially in immunocompromised patients, and patients who might be acutely septic or hemodynamically unstable during your operation. Um, so although it doesn't prevent a leak, it does prevent the potential for pelvic sepsis, which can, um, especially in your pouch patients, uh, lead to some functional differences in the long term, um, which we would like to preserve. Um, so a lot of the studies do say that ileostomies and colostomies are equivalent functionally, but most surgeons would still um, kind of lean toward the side of doing an ileostomy um, for its ease of reversal. Thank you for your time.